The best content teaches people how to make their life or work better in some way. In other words, great content upgrades people. And an expert in this topic is Shannon Howard. She's the Director of Customer and Content Marketing at Intelum, a leading customer education platform. Today, she'll share how to launch a successful customer education program. In this Marketing Pops episode, you'll learn how to first create content that guides people along the next step in their customer journey. Second, select the types of content to educate and best level up your customers. Third, how to measure customer education programs. And number four, how to tap into communities to accelerate your career. And before I get started, I created a free power-ups cheat sheet that you can download for free and apply Shannon's customer marketing tips. You can find that at marketingpowerups.com right now or in the show notes and description below. Are you ready? Let's go. Marketing power-ups. Ready? Go! Here's your host. Rambly Thank you for coming on the show. Super excited to be talking about customer marketing and content, customer education. Uh, particularly, it seems like it fits in to what you're doing at Intelum. Uh, you know, first of all, I'm curious why customer education. I know you've written about this. Why it's so important for people to to see that as part of the success of their customer marketing efforts, particularly to make sure that they're their success of the customers is really well. So what what are some benefits of, of having that for people who are like, why do I need to have a, you know, academy or, you know, some training programs or things like that for our customers? Yeah. So I think of the saying, the educated buyer is a better buyer. I think an educated customer is a better customer. So when we help people learn how to use our products and services really well, they're just better across the board. They they buy more, they retain at a higher rate. Uh, they're better advocates because they're just more engaged and involved. And I think you see that a lot with like HubSpot Academy, right? If we expand our definition of customer from just paying customers to also prospects, then we have this opportunity to start building a relationship with people, helping them level up in their career. And then by the way, our product can also help you do your job or level up in your career. So I see that as very important. Um, but recently, Gainsight, so customer, they kind of defined a customer success, acquired a customer education company. And so I see that as a really promising future for customer education that, that people are thinking more about um, how do we scale, how we educate, train customers, help them better adopt our platform um, so they can ultimately be successful. So I, I think that's the thing is customer education is... It's like customer success at scale in a lot of ways where often customer success managers are doing onboarding or training one-on-one with people and customer education is thinking about how do I do that in a more scalable way, especially if you have different levels of accounts where it doesn't make sense for someone to be spending that one-on-one time with a customer training them. That makes sense. So what I'm hearing is it's about like doing instead of a one-to-one, which I think I uh, read somewhere that the way to scale it, it's hire more customer success managers, which is not scalable. Oh. <laughs> this is about like a one-to-many effort, this exactly. education. Yeah, it's more it's an efficiency. Um, how do you efficiently train and onboard and educate not just your customers, but mm-hmm. potential prospects about your business, essentially? Yeah, and I think maybe something important to note, too, is that customer success managers have a different skill set than customer education professionals. And so... You know, it's kind of like when you create content, not all content is educational content. Content can serve different purposes. Um, so I think customer education professionals are looking at how do we drive behavior change through this learning, whether it's training or it's e-learning, um, it's a help article. How are we driving behavior change ultimately, uh, you know, getting the customer to adopt the product or solve their own problems uh, versus, you know, just what I think most of us would consider to be training, which is maybe just walking someone through the product. Mm, it makes sense. I want to dig into Intelum uh, and how you work with other teams to educate customers. It's interesting because Intelum is like customer education platform. And I'm assuming like, you know, you guys, you, you probably do this well <laughs> than other companies and probably ahead of others. You uh, are, you know, director of customer marketing and content. How do you work with other teams to, I guess, educate customers and you know, prospects around the product and customer education industry in general? 
Yeah. So we have, we're very fortunate to have a nice, healthy size customer education team that serves different audiences. So some of them are working on internal education, whether that's compliance training, professional development, or product education and enablement for internal employees. And then we have people focus more on product education for customers, industry education for customers. So we think it's important for our customers to not only know how to use our product, but also what does it look like to to do reporting on customer education? Or how do you come up with a thoughtful education strategy that starts with business goals, thinks about and considers the audience or audiences that you're going to be educating and then kind of builds from there because a lot of people think content first and then kind of try to tie it to other things. We want people to think uh, business objectives and audience first and then from there kind of build out their content. So we have that education team creating content and then on my side, I'm creating things on the blog and we were kind of chatting before we started recording, but I love as a as a content marketer with a you know experience in education, I want to make sure that the content I'm producing is useful and relevant and educational in some way. So it may not be as fully fleshed out as uh, a, a full e-learning course or a live training. But if someone reads this, can they walk away with a better understanding of something? They have an action item that they can take and implement. So that's what I'm thinking or the perspective that I'm bringing to content. And then so we're working together to figure out what content can we create that's useful to both prospects and customers, whether it's gated or in, in our uh, learning management system or it's ungated on our website? And then how are we serving that up to customers and prospects on a regular basis so they can continue to learn from us and build a relationship with us? You mentioned that you write content for the blog and how I, I was just curious how that like how do you work with customer education to I don't know, figure out what to write about or do you like get snippets of their their stuff to write content so that it leads to to their training or education or other stuff that they're working on? So when I'm looking at blog content and figuring out what are we going to create, I kind of have a mix of content. So things that are maybe for SEO purposes, things that are maybe more thought leadership or featuring our customers. And then I'm also looking at what is the education team working on and creating or what is, you know, coming down the product pipeline and how do I create content that kind of bridges the gap to that? So I'm thinking when I'm creating a piece of content, like what next? Like where are they going from here? What am I pointing to? What am I trying to get them to think about more, whether that is the product or continue learning here, or go check out this blog, download a recent research report, whatever it is. So that's how I'm kind of using what education is doing to kind of inform that up funnel blog content. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. And then in, in in those blog posts that are meant for the latter, that what you're talking about, like that is leading to the, uh, the education uh, programs. I'm guessing there's a call to action at the bottom, like, I'm not sure. Sign up for. I know there are some training pro, uh, some training sessions that y'all are hosting or other stuff that you're working on. That the CTA would be towards those things rather than white paper or something. Exactly. Yeah. So we have these kind of blocks that we use to promote different things, whether it's a research report or our monthly recurring webinar series, or if it is a course. And so I'm kind of looking at even. Um, so we're we're teaching, educating a lot on. Like I was talking about kind of starting with business objectives, audience, things like that. So we have a full framework and methodology that we use. And so I'm taking that and I'm kind of breaking it into smaller things that are interesting to people. Like, how do you set your KPIs for education or how do you measure the ROI of customer education and customer training? How do you think about learner personas or do a training needs analysis? And I'm breaking that down into smaller pieces that are blog relevant, but that content then may be expanded upon in a course or a certification. I mean, you mentioned it, <laughs> you wrote a, a whole blog post, which I'll link in the show notes around how do you measure the ROI of those training programs? What are some people for people who are like, Hey, I, we should do a, 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 you know, a training or education program for our own SaaS product. Like what, how, how do you, how do they think about measuring the ROI? I think it depends on what you're trying to get out of it. So we recently hosted a panel discussion where people were talking about the metrics that they're measuring with their customer education programs. And sometimes it's about revenue generation, right? You're selling professional services, you're selling training packages. And sometimes it's about revenue retention. And so you're looking at 
cohorts of maybe trained versus untrained customers or educated customers versus on uneducated customers. And that could be, did they complete onboarding? Do people who complete or onboarding see higher retention rates or higher product adoption and usage rates? Do we see those customers expanding um, their contract with us, whether they're adding more users or they're, they're expanding into different po- product modules? Could be um, for people who are active in our online academy, are those people more likely to retain? So some of these things, I think, take time to to see the difference, um, especially if you have annual contracts and it's not like a month over month subscription. But I think typically you're looking at those like kind of trained versus untrained, involved with education versus un- uninvolved in education. Are they more likely to retain? Are they more likely to expand? Are they more likely to use more of your product and even advocacy? Do we see a, a link um, between customers who are better educated on our product and then they're also maybe leaving reviews on online review sites or they're doing case studies or they're serving as references for future customers. We can kind of look at influence in a couple different areas. Um, I feel like any data analysts worth their salt would say, you know, correlation does not equal causation. <laughs> That's true. But I think, yeah. you know, it is it is about influence. Do we see that mm. difference? And a lot of people, when they're examining the difference, they're able to see, hey, we saw a 30% lift here or 60% mm. lift here for our trained versus untrained customers. So I think that cohort analysis is helpful. Before I continue, I want to thank the sponsor for this episode, 42 Agency. Now, when you're in scale-up growth mode and you have to hit your KPIs, the pressure is on to deliver demos and signups, and it's a lot to handle. There's demand gen, email sequences, rev ops, and more. And that's where 42 Agency, founded by my good friend, Camille Rexton, can help you. They're a strategic partner that's helped B2B SaaS companies like ProfitWall, Teamwork, Sprout Social, and HubDoc to build a predictable revenue engine. If you're looking for performance experts and creatives to solve your marketing growth problems today and help you build the foundations for the future, look no further. Visit 42agency.com to talk to a strategist right now to learn how you can build a high efficiency revenue engine. Thank you also to the sponsor for this episode, Riverside.fm. Riverside.fm is my go-to video podcast recording tool. This whole show is recorded on it. What I love about it is that it's almost like being in a virtual studio, which makes it possible to record and edit at the highest quality possible. Riverside.fm also records locally for myself and my guests. So if anyone has unstable internet connection, I can still get studio quality audio and video recording. And now with their AI engine, I can accurately transcribe my recordings as well as get vertical videos for Instagram Reels, TikTok, and YouTube Shorts automatically using the new feature called Magic Clips. Don't take my word for it. You can go to Riverside.fm right now to try it out for free or find the link in the show note and description. Anyway, let's get back to our episode. And it's really about if the, the hypothesis is the more that somebody's using a product in many different ways, the less likely, you know, they're learning it through this programs like new use cases and it's like a i guess like a tentacle where like they've attached themselves to the product so much that it's hard for them to let go because they've learned it through other uh, other means through that so i think that totally makes that totally makes sense as a, as a measurement and the interesting thing you talked about like advocacy i think when people started sharing and talking about it um not necessarily about the product but the education programs where they're like telling their friends uh, about the training that that's an interesting loop on its own that hey this program is great that's uh you should you should take it too is, is that what you're seeing other companies uh sp- specifically results that they get through that yeah that's i'm seeing a lot and i think that's also a measure too for companies too is not only how many people are earning certifications certifications or they're completing courses but then how many people are then talking about it mostly on LinkedIn. Are they adding it to their profile? Do they they think it's LinkedIn profile worthy? Are they announcing to the world, hey, I just completed this course and I earned this certification? I see those. Maybe this is just because I you know, work in the customer education industry, but I see a lot of those right. come up in my feed. If I just finished this at Data Camp or I just finished this you know, certification over here. Um, so I think we're seeing more of that. And it does have brand value because it's people just promoting your company and, and you're not paying for it. You know, you're just doing this education. And then those people found the education so valuable that they started talking about it, provided a link back to your website. Um, 
which, you know, increases your exposure to potentially new audiences and other, you know, target customers. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Uh, you mentioned something earlier around like, you know, on top of the other content that you're creating, one of them is around thought leadership. I feel like that's also very uh, helpful to not just customers, but like establishing yourself as a leader in a category and helping, you know, people see you as that leader. What does that look like at Intelum? Like, uh, I know, you know, Erin Balsa, who was uh, one of the guests for this show, she created some white paper. Is it just those white paper? I'm curious what thought leadership specifically looks like, thought leadership content specifically looks like at Intelum. Sure. So we do, um, we have uh, proprietary research reports that Erin helps us with because she's awesome. And so that's looking at, you know, what are people in the field saying? And Erin's really gifted at that kind of get capturing the data, capturing the insights, and then being able to share those um, with the world of, you know, what are people doing with their education programs? Who owns this initiative? Um, what metrics are you measuring? Things like that. We also host a monthly webinar series where we talk about things related to the industry. So we just talked about um, proving the value of your learning programs. We're really talking about marketing um, your education programs and driving engagement because it's not just that one time, you know, launch of a new certification or launch of your online academy, but you've got to get people to continue to come back. And, you know, we live in a world where people have a lot of options and opportunities to learn. Um, how do we get them coming back to us and continue to learn from us? Uh, so we host those every month too. So we're very fortunate to have a lot of people internally who have that subject matter expertise or a lot of experience in the field who can come on. But we're also kind of looking to other people in the industry to join us and join the conversation and share from their experience, the things that they're doing, the programs that they're running, um, what are they seeing and what's helpful. So trying to help facilitate more of those conversations and have the thought leadership, but also kind of ground it a little bit in action. We don't want to talk too much theory. We also want to talk about, well, you know, what do we do with that information? Yeah. It's interesting that those kind of stuff is so valuable for both customers and potential prospects. Uh, are you finding, I mean, are you finding more customers are signing up for those and consuming it more rather than, or maybe it's uh, the same mix where it's like, you know, it, it, since it applies to both, it, you know, it, this content can apply and help out both of them. I've seen kind of both like a split of prospects and customers. Certainly, it's an opportunity to reach more people who aren't maybe currently in our customer base or currently even in our prospect base, but definitely a lot of customers too, where they're asking these questions. And that's kind of how I source a lot of topics as I look at what are people talking about in the customer education Slack? What's coming up in conversations with our relationship managers? What is the sales team hearing when they're talking to people? And then figuring out, well, how do we speak to that and answer those questions for people? So a lot of questions recently about measuring and proving the value of your learning programs, um, marketing your programs. We recently released stuff on gamification, but that's also been a huge topic in customer education. It's kind of gamification is having its heyday the last few months. So you know, we had an opportunity to ask people, how are you using gamification in your learning experiences and how are you gamifying learning? Um, yeah, so that's been interesting because it is relevant and applicable to both audiences. And I think that's, to me, the key to really great content is you don't just create for one audience and one purpose, but you can kind of multi-purpose. Interesting. You mentioned something interesting there. There's a customer education Slack. Is it including customers? I'm guessing those are not necessarily like the customer education Intelum team, it's it's every, is it a customer community essentially? Is that what that's about? It is, uh, it's an industry community. So more of like a practitioner community of practice type community um, that's product agnostic. So that's actually um, have met a lot of people and was kind of involved in there before I came to Intelum. Um, but that's, I love that group because it's kind of like, you know, with, the product-led growth Slack or community, uh, or sorry, customer marketing, there's kind of these pockets of people who are doing the thing and you can talk to them about, well, how are you doing the thing? Or how did you overcome this very specific obstacle that I don't, you know, there's no one else at my company who does the same job. So I want to learn from people who have kind of been there and done that. Mm -hmm. So it's not owned by Intel. It's more like, it's like a product. Interesting. So you're doing actual, like almost user or customer or topic research by asking questions into specific that's very smart. 
I think more people should like learn from from that rather than like uh, you know like taking it out of the sky. You're know, actually like sourcing, crowdsourcing problems and ideas and points specifically from mm-hmm. the community rather than yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe two comments I'll add on that. <laughs> One is um, social media managers do this thing called like a social listening report of mm-hmm. what what are people talking about on our social channels? What are the topics and conversations that are coming up? And I think we can do that with community too. too. And Joel Primack had kind of written something on voice of community or social listening and community. Um, so I think that, yeah, can be a great way to inform our thought leadership content, our education content, our content strategy is what are people talking about questions are they asking but then i also think with community marketing um we don't always have to have our own community we do have a customer community that's just for customers but there are already communities of practice out there that have thousands of people and maybe they're not customers but then you're getting actually this broad swath of people and you're hearing what problems are they running into what questions do they have what are some pain points in the industry? It could be super helpful, not just for marketing, but even for product managers and product teams to be in there and be listening to the conversations that are happening in the industry. So I think those online communities are, are very much an under um, underrated aspect of kind of our marketing and product uh, programs. That's super cool. I, I like that. It's like approaching content as a product. You do like before you build a product, do user research and you're tapping into a voice of uh, your users or your 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 people, and that's really really smart approach uh, there with that. In, in terms of like how your your measured your role is measured, you're both content and customer marketing uh, director. Are you more measured on the content side with like you know traffic and and uh, you know organic traffic and other things like that and signups for those white papers or are you? Do you have also some KPIs for your role around the customer marketing side? I'm curious how your how your 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 you yourself measure your work success. Yeah, so right now it's kind of a split between the two, and I want to say on the content side, it is more of those the traffic conversions, and then kind of falling that down the pipeline, showing influencer attribution toward um, opportunities and and close one. Um, on the customer side, this is a relatively new function. So when I came to Intellum, it was partly to invest in content, um, manage a team around brand and communications and events, but then also kind of start up this customer marketing function, which is like, I love doing that. So in today's world, I want to say that the metrics are more output related. So around review generation and new customer stories and case studies, and really one of my big objectives was just to highlight the voice of our customers more because we have really cool customers. I was talking to a friend last night. I said, it's insane. Some of the conversations that I get to have with people who are doing really cool things for really cool companies. And then I just get to kind of share that with the world, Uh, whether that's through blog content or case studies or having them on a a webinar, recording them on video, just hearing kind of their stories and sharing that. So, um, I feel like nobody wants to have an output related metric, right? But I think that's in the state of the world today, you know, the state of this program being relatively new. Right now, we're kind of in output world and then we'll work toward proving uh, engagement, retention, influence on expansion, things like that. But we'll, I think that's going to take some time to get there. And that customer marketing content you're talking about is a huge part of enablement for sales and for CS as well, where talking about success stories and those are really valuable especially when they're trying to close a deal or trying to retain a customer um having those stories uh is very very helpful and just to call out like i'm on the site here you're talking about customers like meta amazon stripe zoom so those are some huge companies (laughs) like well-known companies that that's why you're excited to chat with them and highlight their stories of what they're doing uh, to, to to educate the customers and their their market essentially that's super cool yeah very cool things i um sometimes feel like i'm talking with celebrities i don't think they think of themselves that way but i'm like wait it's this person from this company like that's really cool yeah that's funny we were just talking about aaron boss of being a celebrity now and you got to know her before she be she blew up so <laughs> that's your house for dinner that's funny 
<laughs> you aspire to be a celebrity one day? Not like celebrity like Kim Kardashian, but like, you know, like a, a top, quote unquote top leader. I mean, you're a top 100 CMA. I saw that on your on your LinkedIn. So is that is that something that you that you want or aspire or do you just enjoy the work itself so much that that's not a priority? It's a good question. I don't know that I aspire to any level of fame, but I like to help people. And that, you know, a lot of my involvement in online communities, like with that whole top 100 CMA, it wasn't even because at that point I was posting on LinkedIn a lot. It was because I was in communities and I was hopping on calls and helping people plan out their programs or troubleshoot something or sharing templates and things that I had I had created for my own programs and I just kind of strip out company info and say, hey, here's how I approach G2 review campaigns or here's how I do my quarterly planning or sharing things like that. So that's um, if like I, I do now, I think, have a goal of growing my following online, but just so I can like share with more people um, things that are helpful to them because I figure it's kind of like with marketing. I don't think marketing or sales are bad as long as what you're doing helps people. If it's if you're ultimately going to make a difference in someone's life, like market away, sell away. That makes sense. I did see that post. I'm going to link that thing in the um, the C, uh, the community, customer marketing community around like getting reviews. It's interesting that part of your role as well. Like, h- how do you successfully get those like success stories and those? Um, those reviews. I'm guessing it's through like relationship and like just first of all, something easy like getting them a quote on the blog, which leads into, hey, it seems like we had a great conversation. Like, would love to get a review uh, through through that. Like, naturally, is that how you approach it, or like have you you done a more programmatic, like, I'm not sure, um, you know, email sequence and stuff like that way to to approach reviews and success stories. I definitely think right now I'm in the more manual relationship oriented stage of customer marketing. And I don't have problems with that. I think a lot of programs start and should start more manual, more one to one until you figure out what works. So eventually we'll have kind of a full blown advocacy program. But in today's world, account executives and relationship managers will kind of nominate customers that they've been talking to that they think are doing really cool things. Or our executive leadership team has a lot of relationships because some of our customers have been with us. We're a 22-ish year old company and some of our customers have been with us for 10, 15, 20 years. So some of their original AEs were our our co-founders. So they know those accounts really well. And so they'll make an introduction and say, hey, you should talk to so-and-so over here. And then I'll be having a conversation with them where I can figure out, is there a story here or is this a webinar? And And as we've done, so earlier this year, we released this video series called The Making of Gusto Academy, which is really cool (laughs) because they worked with us in a a video production company to chronicle their story from start to finish of how they created all this content and launched their online academy, which has been wildly successful. Um, And that, when we put that out, customers thought that was so cool. One, because it was really well produced and it was a great story and they learned a lot from it. It wasn't just a case study. It was actually something that they could learn from, take things away. But we had people coming out of the woodwork like, hey, can I speak on an underscore? Can I write a blog with you? Someone reached out to me the other day, said, hey, are you going to be at this conference? They have speaking opportunities. I'd love to work with you on something. And I was like, this is what I live for. <laughs> you know, Some people have to really, um, really go after and find those customers. And I'm, I'm very fortunate that they are, they are coming out of the woodwork to me right now. That's super cool. Uh, that, you know, I do appreciate that it's more human approach rather than sometimes like automating things takes away that humanness and that realness to, you know, asking a review for, for things. So that's super cool that it, it does stay that way uh, for now. I actually want to shift gears and talk about career power-ups. Now, I know you've been in marketing now for over a decade. You've had like roles in many places, including Predictive Index, Litmus, and now you're Intellum. I'm curious, like, what's a power-up or power-ups that's helped you get a leg up in your your marketing career? All right. So I had two. 
because we had talked about how sometimes <laughs> people have like a soft skill and then sometimes it's a hard skill. Yeah. So the soft skill one is being involved in communities. And mm. I think this works for me because that is literally like one of my core values. My husband and I have like three, four core values in life and community is one of them. So it just, cool. I've always been in online communities and that's been helpful. Most of my jobs, like the job that I got at Litmus was from the product led growth community. Um, I got another job in customer education because of the customer marketing community. I got my job in curriculum development from a student community for an online school. So that worked for me because I just love community. Um, but beyond just being a place where you can get jobs, I think you can learn from people who are doing the thing, you know, like if I have a question about customer marketing, I go to the customer marketing Slack community and I ask them, hey, who's done this before? Does anybody have an example of this that they can share? How have you navigated around this problem? Because there are people who will just pop in and answer your question much faster than me trying to track it down on the internet or start from scratch. So an old manager of mine, we used to say, if you're starting from scratch, you're doing it wrong. None of us are creating anything like entirely new. We can start from somewhere. The more hard skill thing is learning how to get comfortable digging. <laughs> so like I, I will go like dig for data or dig for buyer journeys and track things like grab someone's email from a form submission and then go follow like what did they download and what did they do and when did sales talk to them and what happened here and what, you know, education content did they access and just go follow the rabbit hole. And I don't think that that's always the best use of time. You know, Hopefully we don't all have to like follow a rabbit rabbit trail all the time. But I think it also gives you a lot of understanding of the buyer journey and what customers are doing and how they interact with things. It helps you to wrangle data where, um, you know, a lot of us, are, our data lives in all these disparate platforms, right? You've got product data here and you've got your CRM data and your, you know, marketing automation data and education data. And it lives in all these different places. And to just kind of pull and and synthesize and pivot table away and like just figure it out, you know, like track down all the rabbit holes and like try to connect the things. Um, I think that's been helpful and it's taught me a lot. Um, I always joke with people who are, you know, early stage marketing or marketing interns, don't resent data entry, don't resent data hygiene. Like you will do it for forever. And honestly, it'll teach you so much about who your customers are, who your prospects are, what all is happening. I've become very intimately acquainted with, with different customer accounts over the years because I was in Salesforce, like trying to figure out reports and why aren't all of our customers pulling into here. But then you learn like who all these people are and you kind of know that off the top of your head. Um, so I think that's been been helpful because I I can kind of know those things that then people are like, oh, how did you do that? Or how do you know about that account? Or how did you figure that out? So I think kind of that being willing to deep dive and wrangle the data um, has been a helpful skill, just not just career development wise, but just like figuring out how do I figure out my own prospects and customers and business. And that gives you the edge with your content. I think that's where like it separates like often good content and great content. It's like having you know, not just a voice of customer, but having like data to proprietary data that you can share through research or internal data that could be interesting through it. So that's super cool. The other thing with your community that you mentioned, that's super cool. You got your jobs through communities. I know you've been super active in the customer marketing, um, the CMA community, I think. And you're, that's an interesting power up that I think generosity to help people is such an undervalued thing that it opens up doors. I think that's uh, what I'm just hearing here is that helping other people has opened up a lot of doors for you, uh, mm -hmm. would you say? Yeah, there's a great book that I read. I found it in a, a little free library called The Go-Giver. It's like a short business fable. It maybe takes an hour to read, but it's on that concept. So that's one of our family values is generosity, is to just be generous with our time, our gifts, our talents our resources, our connections, like I always, but again, this is kind of how I'm wired. Like I really love to connect people. It brings me a lot of joy. It gives me a lot of energy. It's naturally how my brain thinks. So like, I also want to encourage people lean on your strengths, but generosity has never hurt anyone. Uh, it has never done a bad thing for anyone. So I think being generous is a great, a great strategy to employ in life. Um, 
professionally and personally. If you enjoyed this episode, you'd love the Marketing Power-Ups newsletter. I share the actionable takeaways and break down the frameworks of world-class marketers. Go to marketingpowerups.com to subscribe and you'll instantly unlock the three best frameworks that top marketers use to hit their KPIs consistently and wow their colleagues. I want to say thank you to you for listening and please like and follow Marketing Power Ups on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. If you're feeling extra generous, can you leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify? Leave a comment on YouTube. It goes a long way in others finding out about Marketing Power Ups. Thanks to Mary Sullivan for creating the artwork and design. And thank you to Faisal Kaigo for editing the intro video. And of course, thank you for listening. That's all for now. Have a powered up day. Marketing Power Ups. Until the next episode.